You are listening to Social Europe Podcast. We discuss cutting-edge thinking on politics, economy and employment and labour with some of the most thought-provoking people around, including Nobel Prize winners and other internationally acclaimed experts. So welcome and enjoy the conversation. This episode of Social Europe Podcast is brought to you by the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford. The Oxford Executive MBA enables current and future business leaders to make a difference in their chosen field. The part-time program is designed to fit alongside your work commitments and offers you a global network. Visit the Zaid Business School, University of Oxford website for further details. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Social Europe Podcast, episode 42. My name is Henning Meyer, Editor-in-Chief of Social Europe. Today, I'm in conversation with Colin Meyer of Oxford University, and we're talking about the future of the corporation, and in particular about why businesses have to rediscover their historic purpose. As always, I hope you enjoy the conversation. Uh, Colin Meyer, thank you very much uh, indeed for taking the time today to talk to me about the future of the corporation in the 21st century, and especially about the role of the corporation uh, in society going forward. Um, just to get us going, um, before we talk about the future of the corporation, where would you see the biggest sort of more recent failures of uh, corporations and especially their role in society? And what were the drivers of this? There are three clear failures of the corporation. The first is in relation to the growing levels of inequality, both in terms of income inequality and wealth inequality. People have pointed to the growing disparity that exists between those at the top of organizations and those on the shop floor. But even more striking than that is the, is the growth in terms of the disparity between accumulations of wealth and the way in which that wealth has been concentrated in the hands of an ever smaller number of highly wealthy individuals. The second manifestation is in terms of environmental degradation and the way in which business has been contributing to the continuing problems that we are seeing in terms of uh, decline in natural capital, in biodiversity, CO2 emissions, and climatic changes that are in progress. And the third is in relation to the growing levels of mistrust in business. Trust in business is one of the lowest of any professions, including uh, an, uh, approximately in line with the level of mistrust in politics. And that's been a feature for a long period of time, but people's awareness of mistrust in business has, I think, been intensifying recently. Now, those three elements in terms of inequality, environmental degradation, mistrust, all have their underpinnings in the same context, and that is in relation to the objectives that are perceived to lie behind the running of business. That objective was put forward by Milton Friedman some 60 years ago when he said that there is one and only one social purpose of business, to increase profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game. And that's been the basis of what we've been observing happening in terms of growing levels of inequality, environmental degradation, and mistrust. But in your previous work, you uh, you worked out um, very interestingly that obviously that hasn't always been so. So what was the sort of historical role of business uh, before the kind of switch uh, you know, that you just mentioned to the Friedmanite idea that it's just about profits? Well, indeed, the nature of business for nearly all of its 2,000-year history has been very different from the prevailing paradigm over the last 60 years. The corporation was established under Roman law 2,000 years ago to perform very public functions as the Societas Publicanorum. It was involved in collecting taxes, minting coins, looking after public infrastructure. And it's only over the last 60 or so years that the notion, as described by Milton Friedman, that there is only one purpose of business, namely to make money 
has arisen. And that came in response to a belief that increasingly in the 20th century, with growing dispersion of shareholding, that management was becoming increasingly unaccountable to any outside parties. And that lack of accountability led to a view as expounded by Milton Friedman that management should be focused on just one objective, and that is to promote the interest of their shareholders, their, uh, their owners. And that focus on shareholder value, what has become known as shareholder primacy, has increasingly dominated practice of business, policy making, and the education of business. And, uh, you know, in, in a TED talk that you gave a few years ago, uh, you know, when you try to think about what should the, the future role of the corporation be against the backdrop of, you know, where it was historically and, and how it deviated from that trajectory in the last 60 years or so, um, you came up with what, what you call the three R's. Uh, could you maybe explain what you mean by this? Right. Okay. So uh, the, the, the nature of business looking forward that we need to uh, rediscover is in terms of a business that is focused on what the purpose of business should be, namely in terms of producing profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet. And that requires a, a, a rediscovery of this role of business in society as performing a central function in terms of addressing the issues that we face in relation to the problems of the world. So what Friedman pointed towards was the notion that the only purpose of business was to make money. And being profitable is an important component in terms of what business should be doing, but it, it, it isn't the purpose. The purpose of business is not to produce profits. The purpose of business is to produce profitable solutions to the problems of people and planet, and it shouldn't profit from producing problems for people or planet. And in so doing, what it does is to commit to those who help to create the corporate purpose, and they in turn help to give rise to that a uh, profitable set of solutions. And that in turn gives rise to reciprocal relations between those who contribute to the uh, corporation and those who own the corporation. It gives rise to more loyal customers, more reliable suppliers, more supportive shareholders and societies. And that gives rise to greater profits, revenues, and lower costs for companies. So That notion of there being a mutual benefit is a critical element in terms of thinking about the repositioning of, of the corporation. So rediscovering this mutuality is, is one of the underlying uh, necessities, you would say. Yes, it's exactly that. It's the notion that what really drives and motivates people is a notion that they are contributing to something that is of greater purpose than they individually can contribute. And that notion of harnessing the desire of people to contribute to a common purpose is what creates a sense of fulfillment, meaningful employment, and purposeful work. And that is something that has been increasingly undermined on this sole objective of seeking monetary reward and profit. So we need to re-harness people's inclination to contribute to greater purposes in terms of their role in society and to recognize that this is a very strong motivational basis behind individuals. And businesses as organizational units have to be rethought as vehicles that uh, serve this specific purpose. Absolutely. That business is a tremendous way of harnessing that sense of purpose in individuals. The way in which economics describes individuals is in terms of homo economicus, that individuals are greedy, selfish, and lazy. 
And that's the notion that has driven all of thinking uh, since the utilitarian view of the individual was put forward in the 19th century. And that gives rise to a notion that what should happen in business is one has to incentivize people to respond to that notion of that greedy, selfish, lazy person to get them to promote the interests of the owners of the company. But in essence, all that that does is to reinforce the notion that individuals are uh, not contributing to solving broader problems of society. What alternatively business and other institutions can do is to perform a transformation function of transforming that individual self-interest into a common collective good. And that is something that the most inspiring and aspiring organizations are increasingly succeeding in doing. On the other hand, business can do exactly the opposite. By, by pampering to this notion of incentivizing people through monetary reward, what it simply does is to encourage a notion that the corporation is there to promote individual self-interest. And it can therefore shift people more in the direction of being homo economicus, selfish, greedy, and lazy, or it can push them in the direction of that real sense of contributing to a common purpose. And that is what we need business to increasingly do. So on a philosophical basis, you could put it into a nutshell, maybe more public spirit and less Jeremy Bentham. Exactly right. That we should recognize what lies behind the motivation of individuals and that increasingly it's being recognized that it's not just a notion of rationality that uh, motivates individuals, that rationality is in inherently connected with people's sense of emotions. And those sense of emotions are in turn connected to feelings that organizations can help to influence in terms of the culture of those organizations. So those cultures can be collaborative, cooperative in nature, in uh, appealing to people's sense of the consciousness of the environment within which they're operating, or it can exacerbate that notion of selfishness uh, by promoting the, 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 the belief that monetary reward is basically the driver of mankind. And you're, you're currently directing a very important uh, uh, research program at the British Academy, which is looking Partic in, in particular on the future of the corporation in society. And uh, you, you published some preliminary findings uh, towards the end of last year. And uh, if I read this correctly, you distilled in order you know, to have companies move into this new direction. Uh, you distilled three principles uh, that companies should adopt, which is uh, they need to have well-defined and aligned purposes. Uh, they need to have a commitment to trustworthiness. Uh, and they need to embed a, a culture which is reflecting uh, the purpose and the trustworthiness. Could you maybe elaborate on how these three principles work together? Yes. So what we did was we brought together some 30 academics from across the world, from different disciplines, from uh, all the uh, humanities and the social sciences, to look at this question as to what should the corporation of the 21st century look like? How should it address these problems about increasing political, economic, environmental changes that business is facing? And how should they take advantage of technological opportunities that are offering tremendous opportunities for enhancing the well-being of society? And what, were, what emerged were, was a remarkable degree of consensus from these people from very different backgrounds and different places in the world as to what needs to happen on three subjects. The first was the urgency and need for change. The second was in terms of a reconceptualization of what business should be. And the third was in terms of the levers that are needed to be pulled to bring about that change. On the reconceptualization that reconceptualization was around three principles, the first of which was, what is the purpose of business? Why does it exist? Why is it created? What is it there to do? And the notion that emerged in terms of a reconceptualization of business was around this idea 
that the purpose of business is not to produce profits, but to produce profitable solutions for the problems of people and planet. And a recognition that the most successful businesses in the world do exactly that. And they don't profit from producing problems for people or planet. And the second element of that reconceptualization was that the trustworthiness of business was critical to a demonstration of a credible purpose, that companies were really credibly committing to the delivery of those purposes. And to create that notion of trustworthiness, the values of the business were of immense importance. Values of honesty and integrity and cultures in organizations of commitment to those corporate purposes. And you identified, uh, if I read this correctly, five particular levers uh, with which you can, you can start to implement uh, these principles, which is the elements of ownership, corporate governance, regulation, taxation, and investment. So how would a strategy, you know, combining these, these levers, uh, what would this look like? How would you go about okay. this? Okay, so let me just describe how we are taking forward the work of the uh, Future of the Corporation program in terms of actual implementation. And you've mentioned some of the main levers that we're looking at. First of all, in relation to law. Law defines the corporation. Sometimes said that the corporation is a legal figment. It's, it's, it's a product of the law. And as a consequence, The law defines what a business does. And the current prevailing view of the legal nature of the corporation is around the notion of shareholder primacy. That is to say that the directors of a company owe their fiduciary responsibilities to promoting the interest of their shareholders. But that's not what corporate law should be about. Corporate law should be about the fiduciary responsibilities of directors to promoting the corporate purpose. They should expect directors to define that corporate purpose, and they should require directors to demonstrate how the ownership and the governance and the things that they measure in the company are aligned with the delivery of that corporate purpose. The second element is in terms of the regulation of business. And at the moment, what regulation is viewed as being in the context of the Friedman view of, of, of business, that it's about the rules of the game and the enforcement of the rules of the game. That's important, but it's not enough. Because in organizations like the utilities, water companies, energy companies, transport companies, the commanding heights of the economy, as they're sometimes described, infrastructure providers public service providers more generally. Those are companies that are performing a public function. And their corporate purposes should be aligned with the public role that they're supposed to be performing, for example, as set out in their licenses to operate. The third element is in relation to ownership. Now, ownership at the moment is associated with the rights of shareholders over companies the rights of shareholders to determine how and who are running companies and how they are incentivized in those organizations and remunerated for what they are doing. But ownership of companies should not be so much about the control of the assets of the company. It should be about the ownership of the purpose of the company. And the owners of a company should be responsible for helping to define those corporate purposes and to establish the values of the business that are required to deliver on those corporate purposes. That's what ownership should be about. And there are a large number of different owners who might be suited to doing that in a particular company. So we shouldn't presume that ownership is about the ownership by institutional investors of the assets of a company, we should allow for diversity, plurality of ownership, given the diversity of businesses that we want to create. 
You mentioned, I think, a very important point that I'm also uh, currently look at in terms of uh, corporate governance and, and public functions. If you look at some of these digital companies, uh, they also seem to fulfill, especially social media companies, a public function with a completely private business model and private governance structures. And you run into troubles uh, all the time there. Would you see a particular conflict there? I mean, if you compare sort of the the digital media companies of today with the public service function of uh, infrastructure companies. So do you see a similar conflict where the organizational principles and the actual business function run into problems? You're making an extremely interesting and important point. And that is the way in which business is changing. Business, 60 years ago when Milton Friedman was writing, was essentially the business of physical assets of companies, tangible assets, buildings, plants, machinery, et cetera. And that's how the Friedman type of view of the world emerged, because it was a view that saw the shareholders as providing the finance to purchase those buildings and machines, et cetera. And so in essence, the shareholders owned the company. They owned its assets. But now what we're seeing is actually 88% of the assets of the S&P 500 index are today intangible assets, in particular, the reputation of companies and their human assets. And human assets, in particular, in the form of employees and the intellectual capital of companies, as, for example, reflected in the Facebooks and the Googles and the LinkedIn in the world. But the second element that's critically important of these intangible companies is the dependence on and the impact they have on societies. So what Facebook is doing is, as you're saying, it's providing a form of infrastructure. It's providing a mechanism of connecting us around the world. It's not connection in the sense that we get on a plane or a train to meet each other. It's that we connect, as you and I are doing at the moment, through an internet medium. And that form of social networking infrastructure will increasingly become a dominant feature of the types of infrastructure that we observe around the world. And the important feature about this is it's it's making that infrastructure global. So we understand the notion of global corporations as multinational corporations operating in many countries. But what is distinguishing these new type of companies is that they are not just multinational corporations. Their products are truly global. A network grows in significance the more global it is. And so the impact that they're having is at a global social level. And one of the reasons why it's proving so difficult to deal with these companies is that that so global social impact stands in marked contrast to the national regulatory systems that we have for regulating those companies. And so what is required is for these companies to appreciate that actually they have an obligation to their societies. So the problem about the Friedman Doctrine is it's all about rights. It's about rights of shareholders over their companies the rights of those who are running companies to operate those companies in the interest of their shareholders. What we should recognize is the obligations and duties that come with being owners and with being the managers of companies in terms of the governance of those companies, that those companies have to be governed for the benefit of societies because increasingly the impact that they're having on societies around the world is growing. Yeah, I mean, one of the key um, corporate governance or organizational conflicts that I'm I'm currently uh, thinking about is that if you are a social media company, you try you're basically the marketplaces of today. So this is the public function, and they always try to um, depict the public realm. They they're all in favor of freedom of expression and so on and so forth. But this necessarily conflicts with the fact that they are a private organization that try to replicate the public space. Freedom of expression uh, is designed to for the public space. Uh, I can create a website and publish whatever I want to, but I cannot force you to allow my opinion on your website. 
right? But this is exactly what happens in, in social media. Uh, and then advertisers, this is where the business model, uh, you know, clashes with this as well. Advertisers don't want to be associated with extremist content, right? But they allow this kind of content on their own platform uh, because they don't want to take a position because they want to sort of uh, recreate the public realm. And they don't do it uh, at 100%. So if you look at the legal framework, uh, nudity or sexual depiction is legal, but they don't allow it on their platforms. So their their community rules are not the same as the legal framework anyway. Absolutely right. And la- and and you're making a very important point that we are increasingly seeing corporations performing public functions. And it didn't it hasn't just occurred with the ar- arrival of social media companies. It started several decades ago in again prompted by the type of Milton Friedman movement, which was reflected in the privatization uh, campaigns that start in the United States and then through Margaret Thatcher, uh, spread into the UK and around the world. At that point, what we were doing was to basically say, we should put the provision of public services in the private sphere. And the way that we tried to align the two was through regulation. And regulation was then supposed to uphold the public interest within the context of privately motivated corporation. But it hasn't worked. And it hasn't worked because the interests of the regulators in the public sphere stand in exact conflict to the interest of those who own and run corporations in the private sphere, purely in profit generation. And so they do whatever they can to circumvent those regulations and, if possible, turn them to their advantage. Mm-hmm. Now, if you take it in the move this forward into the context of social media companies and the points that you were talking about in terms of the usage of private information that's being put into the public domain by social network companies, the utilization of the data of individuals without seeking the consent of those individuals, the determination by these private organizations as to what should be allowed and shown on on their social media and what should not be allowed, that then brings out immediately the issue of, well, what is the purpose of those companies, and how does that purpose compare with that of the public interest? And the answer is, well, if you start off by saying the only interest of those companies is in making money, that immediately creates a major distortion between what we are interested in as societies and individuals and what these companies are pursuing. But if you go on and say, well, actually, no, they've got a broader interest. They're trying to set up some standards by which they're operating, and your examples of nudity, et cetera, is an illustration. Then the question is, well, to what extent is there a conformity between those perceived public purposes that they're performing and what the public actually is seeking to achieve? And that's where this notion of Well, in some parts of the economy, you need to think about how you don't just impose the rules of the game and the enforcement of the rules of the game, because that won't work for the reasons that I've been describing. You have to get to the innate part of the company and its intrinsic purpose and say, is there an alignment between that intrinsic purpose of the corporation and what we outside the corporation as seeing as societies. And that's where I'm talking about thinking of these commanding heights as aligning the purpose of those companies with the public purpose as perhaps in many cases expressed by the, the regulator, but reflected in some form in terms of a social choice provision. Mm. You're absolutely right. I think we're seeing a lot of interesting innovation here at the moment where when you link, as you did before, the purpose, the, the wider purpose of a company as it should be with the corporate governance, 
uh, especially for social media companies. Mark Zuckerberg at the end of last year created what was dubbed in the media a Facebook Supreme Court or the idea of a Facebook Supreme Court. And the fundamental principle behind it was that an appeal against the corporate decision to take content off the platform uh, should not be, uh, that decision should not be taken in-house, but by an external body. So in my view, that's basically the theory on the governance innovation that, that I'm thinking along the lines of. In theory, he was adopting elements of democratic governance to a corporate governance model. He was creating some sort of external jurisdiction in terms of uh, enforcing the rules. But the problem is, as you rightly say, it's not the enforcement of the rule, but it's also the legitimacy of the rule itself. So if the, if the community standard is not the same as the legal framework, because it cannot be, because it's a private, it's, yeah, well, if you ban nudity, why don't you ban hatred and hate speech? So it, the, the question becomes the legitimacy of the rules. And if you cannot have output legitimacy, because there's no uh, objective line that you can draw, you have to have input legitimacy, and you can have some sort of democratic user element in setting the rules of the game to start with. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and that point you're making about the significance of governance, and when we talk about governance here, we mean the corporate governance as against uh, the uh, public governance or the national government, governance of a country. In relation to corporate governance, that is the key aspect um, that one has to consider in this context of how do you create purposeful businesses. And remember, before, before we get into the sorts of issues you've just been raising, remember that we're starting from a much more basic position, that the perceived idea behind corporate governance is simply to align the interests of management with shareholders. Okay, That's, That since the Cadbury Code, Cadbury Committee in 1992, which became the basis of corporate governance codes around the world, is the current perceived role of corporate governance. Okay, Now, what this notion of thinking about the wider role of business in society raises is, well, actually, first of all, corporate governance should clearly not be about simply aligning managerial interests with that of shareholders. It should be about aligning managerial interests with the achievement of the corporate purpose. And once you think about that, then it says, well, who then should the board of the company be accountable to? And should they just be accountable to their shareholders? Clearly not, because the purpose doesn't just relate to being profitable businesses. It relates to the role of business in solving problems in society. And then if you think in those terms, what that implies is that, well, actually, inevitably, there's an element of a political component to a business that cannot be avoided. It cannot be avoided simply by saying, oh, competition will solve that problem. Competition doesn't solve that problem because you just have competition between companies whose objectives are misaligned with those of society. And anyway, competition in many areas is very incomplete or infeasible. And so you have a massive gulf of where competition is not providing adequate protection to society. And once you recognize that, you appreciate that it's important that companies have a form of governance that does reflect exactly what you're describing, their legitimacy in, in, in in society, but not a legitimacy that is imposed, simply imposed through a regulator, but a legitimacy that is hard, it built in hard into the organization itself, so that it's an intrinsic part of the organization, that its governance is there to help the alignment of the business with society more generally. Yeah, and my general sort of the thesis I'm working on is uh, if you have a company with a user base of 2 billion people across the world reflecting a public function, uh, these uh, the division of powers in democratic governance, they did not develop by coincidence. So maybe adopting more elements of this type of governance into the corporate governance models 
for these particular companies that have this particular function could be a way of thinking about it. Absolutely. And that's precisely the idea that lies behind this. And I would say that increasingly, as we observe that the democratic system is unable to deal with these issues and governments are finding it increasingly difficult to fund the top types of uh, services that they've provided in the past, it's going to become ever more important that businesses' interests are not so much in conflict with and in contrast to the objectives of society. We need to incorporate the notions of what we're seeking from our democratic government systems as being a part of the way in which we're structuring our companies as well. Yeah, and, and towards the end, because we've already uh, talked a lot about this and we could probably talk for hours on uh, without ending because it's such an interesting topic. Uh, the second phase of your research uh, program looks at the implementation, so how, how, how this could be uh, implemented. But uh, if you sort of could give me a bit of a preview, if you were a company now, you, you would identify the problem, say, okay, our purpose, we don't have a, a societal really relevant purpose, we are misaligned, we want to change the way we operate. Yes. How would you start doing this in the external function as well as internally within the company? Okay, so that is precisely what uh, has to be addressed. And I, I do a lot of work with uh, companies, with listed companies in terms of their, um, uh, their governance and reviews of the boards of companies. And what I always start off by doing is to pose the question to the board, what is the purpose of your company? And it, in many cases, it's striking how difficult the board finds it to answer that question, or that they've got a vague notion, but they haven't really got a, 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 a clear sense as to why do they exist, why are they created, what are they there to do. That's in contrast to people who are starting up companies, founders of entrepreneurial firms, who normally have a very clear notion as to what they're trying to do and where, where, where they're trying to go to. But, it, but once you come to a, a large listed company, that sort of clarity of vision is frequently lost. So, so that's the starting point. And then the, the next stage is to say, right, okay, now that we've understood the nature of the, of the purpose of the business, how should that be embedded in the business in terms of the nature of the board, the way in which the board is structured, the composition of the board, the way in which the company measures its performance? That's terribly important. What are, what are the criteria by which performance is measured? And then how are those measures of performance related to the incentives in the organization? But perhaps most critical of all, and one which in many cases boards have difficulty in conceptualizing, is the notion of the values of the business. The values of the business as reflected in particular in the culture of the organization. Because a lot of these things one can't actually measure, one can't incentivize in a straightforward way in, 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 a, in a performance sense. So that notion of the culture is, is critically important. So, that, so that's the sort of process internally. And then externally, I then go on to uh, raise the question with the companies of the extent to which they feel that their owners are promoting the success in terms of the delivery of the company. And in many cases, that's the major impediment that companies have in terms of actually delivering on corporate purpose. Not that they're uh, not committed to doing that, but that they feel that they can't carry their investors along in relation to anything other than a focus on profit. And so the first external group that you have to do a rather similar exercise with is in terms of the shareholder community. And increasingly amongst the institutional investors, there is a debate that's going on around, it's the equivalent of thinking about the governance of companies, around the stewardship of institutional investors, which means that institutional investors are not just responsible for maximizing the financial returns for their beneficiaries, their investors, but they've also got a responsibility to the companies in which they're investing to steward those companies. And that notion of creating a stewardship function is essentially the, 
key element of the purpose of those institutions. And thinking again about how do how does an institution really effectively do that in terms of its governance, in terms of its measures of performance, incentives, culture, etc. Is it the exact analog outside of the corporation of what I've just been talking about inside the corporation? And then the third group, which I've been referring to in the, the context of utilities and public service providers, are the regulators. And one of the elements that it's key to, for, for the success of, the, of this program is that regulators also need to understand their purpose. What specific function is regulation seeking to achieve? And as I've described it, regulation at the moment is, is, is basically viewed as being a crime and punishment um, function, that you're, 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 you're seeking to identify abuse, to correct that bu- abuse, and in some cases punish uh, that, that, that abuse. Whereas if you think about purposeful regulation, what purposeful regulation is more about is what we were talking about earlier on in terms of ensuring that the governance structures that companies put in place to deliver on their purposes are consistent with what a public setting would like to see those governance structures as being. Uh, And so purposeful regulation is about really aligning the interests the, the purposes of private corporations with a public purpose for those corporations, not for every corporation, but for those corporations that really do perform a public role. So in a nutshell, the business of the 21st century needs to be a social business. It's not... Not social business not, in, the, in, the, in the sort of narrowly defined sense, but a socially aware, societally aware business. A, 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 a social socially aware, but I I would frankly put it in slightly different terms because if you say a social business, then people think about social enterprise or they think about state-owned enterprises and nationalization and things like that. That's not what this is about. It is social in the sense that there is a recognition that the role of business is to solve problems okay? and to do so in a profitable in a profitable way. And so it it's a repositioning of business around the notion as to it is there to help society, to help individuals, to help nature, the environment, and the planet. And that it can perform that role. It has historically performed that role. And increasingly going forward, we need it to perform that role. So it becomes a social problem-solving tool again, basically. Exactly right. That, that's a better way of expressing it. So, Colin, thank you very much indeed for taking the time uh, this afternoon to talk to me. And, uh, yeah, I think it was a, a great overview over where the problems with uh, the current functioning of corporations uh, is and uh, what possible solutions there could be. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank, you. thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you don't miss future episodes by subscribing to Social Europe Podcast. You can also read our articles on www.socialeurope.eu and follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Social Europe. Until next time. <laughs>